Hello, I'm BJ Robinson, Director of the University of North Georgia Press. Our panel will be talking about using open pedagogy to facilitate adopting OER. I'll be talking about developing open pedagogy based assignments for ancillary material developed for an open textbook, material intended to encourage that textbook's adoption. In partnership with Affordable Learning Georgia and ECOR, the University of North Georgia Press in 2016 published World History, Culture, States, and Societies to 1500, a peer reviewed open textbook developed with ECOR for its History 1111 course. Since its publication, World History has become one of Open ALG's top 10 downloads of all time titles. Open ALG is Georgia's home for open and interactive educational resources. The press received many requests for ancillaries for world history from instructors considering adopting it for their courses. With the support of an ALG continuous improvement grant, two of the text's authors worked with the press to develop ancillary resources for both ECOR and non-ECOR Surveys of History I courses. For, for all of the textbook chapters, the authors developed lecture outlines for topics related to each chapter of sections. For example, chapter one sections included one on human beginnings in Africa and the hominid evolution. They also developed assessment tools, including multiple choice questions, short answer essays, and essay topics that refer to the textbook's questions to guide your reading additional research resources and PowerPoint slideshows. The rubric for all of their ancillary material included its relevance to the textbook's learning outcomes, development of the subject's concepts, diverse materials, resources, and media, diverse learning styles like group interaction, independent and or creative work, active learning methodology like critical thinking, research skills, and problem solving, and overall congruence within and among the chapters. What the authors created met the rubric standards by drawing from the World History eCore class plan, linking to websites and podcasts as diverse media resources, offering suggestions for topic-focused classroom or group discussions, and suggesting activities like defining key terms. To this material, I added open enabled pedagogical assignments, including renewable student engagement activities and student generated test or quiz questions with links to online examples and guidance for both students and instructors. Using the same criteria as that for the textbook author's ancillary material, I designed new open pedagogy non-disposable assignments closely tied to what the text authors created, which could be considered disposable or traditional ancillary material. I did not originate anything new really. However, using open pedagogy affected new assignments, material, goals, and outcomes. In creating the open pedagogy material, I followed the guidance of the spectrum of open practice drafted by David Wiley and John Hilton III to use open resources, provide a strategy for access, make the students producers of OER or contributors to World History One resources, and engage students with public networked open communities for teaching, learning, and research with the products of their, these assignments being open for the public and staying open as a resource for the future. I also tried to follow the definition of good practice for open pedagogy. For open pedagogy, the assumption is that as Robin DeRosa and Raji Giangiani write in open pedagogy, quote, knowledge consumption and knowledge creation are not separate but parallel processes as knowledge is co-constructed, contextualized, cumulative, iterative, and recursive, end quote. Also, according to Robin DeRosa and Scott Robeson in From OER to Open Pedagogy, Harnessing the Power of Open, 
The basic premise of an open pedagogical approach is that in which an instructor guides students to curate and create new knowledge, empowering them as public contributors of ideas through open content as they learn and grow in their disciplinary knowledge. Following this criteria, I created a number of categories for open pedagogy based tasks, projects and assignments based on World History One's content, like its chronologies, maps, questions to guide your reading and key terms, as well as lecture outlines from the author's ancillary material. The lecture outline for chapter one, for example, suggested students review, quote, big prehistory timelines including geologic periods such as the Pleistocene and Holocene, and then place the hominid evolution, the Paleolithic period, and the Neolithic period chronology in this larger context." End quote. This ancillary material suggestion, and others like it, led directly to the Collected History I Annotated Study Maps and or Chronologies category of my open pedagogy-based assignments. In addition to the collected annotated study maps and our chronologies, other assignment categories are collected group presentations on World History I discussion questions, collected World History I key terms, definitions, and definition essays, collected annotations on additional primary or secondary resources, or collected audio readings of primary or secondary sources, Collected World History One biography essays, collected image galleries and collected PowerPoint slideshow presentations, or collected response essays and reviews on World History One textbook content, as well as on online resources like websites, video productions, podcasts, and museum exhibitions. Collected creative writing drawn from World History One material and collected student-generated multiple choice questions on World History One material. To develop the assignments, I used the PACE model, Purpose Alignment Context Engages, which involved considering their purpose. Purpose includes delineating the steps required to complete an assignment, like required course readings and sources collected, as well as providing studios with students with audio, video, or photo editing free open source software or links for assignments involving technology and multimodality. Open pedagogy added making students public contributors of knowledge by contributing their completed assignments or resources to public networked open communities for teaching, learning, and research, and by participating in such open communities. Purpose requires laying the groundwork for assignments by helping students identify what they're going to do, what it's going to look like, and what it will be for each individual assignment, as well as for ongoing publicly shared category collections. For the open pedagogy assignments, that entailed providing information on OER and open pedagogy, as well as examples of open pedagogy-based assignments and resources. It also entailed placing student assignments within the classroom itself with their instructors and peers, as well as beyond the classroom in open communities or open ALG. So they needed to explain how individual assignments would depend on their modality, like explaining how a classroom presentation becomes an online presentation or how annotations of study maps or chronologies become social annotations. PACE also involves alignment, that is, how an assignment aligns with course material. It involves making transparent what the instructor values in terms of students learning the course material, as well as asking students to consider what they themselves value in what they're learning. Open pedagogy adds unique opportunities to what assignments can help students do, because they are student-centered and give students agency, they're dem democratic, collaborative, and diverse. They allow for difference among students themselves and among instructors and students, as well as in how students are as individual writers, readers, and thinkers. For example, the identity students present online may differ from that in the classroom, 
as it can depend on choices not always available in the classroom, at least not in terms of the student instructor relationship. For instance, by their being able to choose remaining anonymous or by creating their own persona. An example of these unique opportunities is from the collected group presentations on World History One discussion questions category. It involved giving students clear guidance on how to create group presentations, like what could be included in their group presentations, as well as options and means for video or audio recording them. A group presentation assignment for World History One, Chapter One, then, asked students to, quote, video or audio record a group presentation on that chapter's discussion suggestions. For instance, discuss the topic of Neolithic megalithic sites, select roles for each participant, peer review the work of each per participant, self-review your own work, have each person develop a question to ask the rest of the class, as well as future visitors to their publicly shared group presentation, with the group selecting the one question they want to ask fellow classmates and future site visitors to answer. This presentation will be included in the collection of group presentations to be uploaded to OpenALG or another digital repository of the instructor's choice." End quote. Most of these directions are not new to such assignments, but the fact that the presentation will be available beyond the students themselves and contribute to a larger knowledge base is new. It includes particular strengths and opportunities, like, again, student agency, as well as using different formats and reaching different audiences and being aware of or meeting different standards and expectations depending on the publishing venues and the presentation's accessibility. Pace adds context as another aspect of assignment design. Context considers how the assignment fits into the course, as well as how it fits within a larger framework like audience in terms of the author audience relationship within the classroom, as well as within open platforms or communities with remote audiences accessing student products far into the future. For example, an assignment in the category of collections of annotated timelines asks students to socially annotate the hominid evolution, the Paleolithic period, or the Neolithic period chronology within the larger prehistory timeline, that is context in which emphasizing larger context in terms of course material is important. But also open pedagogy creates the larger context of students creating this material for not only their immediate classmates, but also remote audiences accessing their publicly available annotations. Audiences who may never have formally studied World History I who want to learn about it and so need different kinds of information from that shared within the classroom, as well as establishing different kinds of authority to speak on the subject, logic in approaching the subject, and persuasion in appreciating the subject. Pace's final aspect of assignment design is engagement, engaging students by placing the responsibility for learning as well as teaching upon the students. Assignments from the collection of response papers and reviews, reviews category did this by having the reviews and responses being to material that is openly available online and so that contributes to their respective open communities. A chapter for Confucius and Confucianism topic focused assignment asked students to write a review essay on the annotations provided in China texts online, the Analects of Confucius, asking students to focus on how one or two of the Analects annotations added to their understanding of the Analects significance to history, philosophy, or culture. In other words, how this material engaged them in the chapter's topic and why. By completing this assignment and making the review essay publicly available as a collection uploaded to OpenALG or another repository of the instructor's choice 
or as a comment about the NLX on China Tech's own website, students both demonstrate what they're learning and engage remote audiences in this learning. Indeed, by making their products publicly available, students essentially model engagement for the remote audience. This moves into Wiley and Hudson's creation and connection levels of the spectrum of open practice in terms of contrib contributing to the field of open pedagogy with open pedagogy-based assignments, as well as OER. To do that, Corey Parson assigned a CC BY license to all original material, developed assignment category templates, and formatted the material for accessibility and adaptability to multiple platforms, including OpenALG. Ariana Adams, who by the way is the genius with the PowerPoint switching every time I pause, uh, formats are open textbooks like World History One for Open ALG. She formats our um, textbooks for multiple platforms, including Open ALG, which also contributes to open pedagogy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Corey Parson, and I'm the managing editor of the University of North Georgia Press. We are the largest publisher of open textbooks in the state of Georgia. So far, we have published 16, 16 textbooks licensed under a Creative Commons license. We use Creative Commons licensing as our main licensing vehicle to allow for individuals to reuse, adapt, and change any of the content that we create so the materials will better fit for their purposes and their needs. Part of our mission is to make sure that instructors adopt our textbooks. We find that instructors are more likely to adopt a textbook if there are ancillary materials available. A lot of big textbook publishers provide these materials to instructors to incentivize their adoption of their expensive textbooks. So in order to compete with these large textbook publishers, we need to provide instructors with something similar as well but provide it at a low or no cost to students. In order to do that, we did get a grant from Affordable Learning Georgia and worked with two authors of the World History text Textbook to create ancillaries for instructors. So the first materials they provided were an instructor guide, which it includes lecture notes, test questions, and additional resources essentially materials that instruct, instructors would want to use in their courses. So my job was to make these instructor materials look consistent throughout each chapter because different individuals were contrib contributing for different chapters. So we want there to be a consistent style throughout all the chapters. So that is part of what I did. I also assigned headers in Word to make sure each document was more easily navigable for instructors. So this would create a table of contents in Word that would allow instructors to see which sections are coming up in the document and to easily navigate between sections in the document. This work was all done in Word, which would allow the instructors to easily add or take away from this material. They can use the styles we set up to make sure the document stays consistent and easy to navigate. So the styles that I use within the document are saved within the document so if they want to create a new subsection, they can apply that header style to that subsection so that the newly created subsection appears on the table of contents for that document. And the instructors will not have to worry about losing that navigability of the document by adding or taking away from that document. PowerPoints are a big part of teaching, I feel, in today's educational environment. So the authors of the textbook um, that we worked with on the grant created these PowerPoints. So the, uh, for the PowerPoint, my job was pretty simple, and that was to try and create a style that was consistent throughout the various PowerPoints for each chapter provided by the authors. We can also make these PowerPoints open with Creative Commons because in many instances, it's using the same images out of the textbook itself. And these images have been cleared for copyright. So we can easily share these PowerPoints openly through Creative Commons. 
Also, because it is a PowerPoint, it is easily edited by the instructors themselves so they can add or subtract from the material what they wish. So now we're on to the test banks. Um, we're trying to do something new with the test questions. Originally, the test questions were within the instructor guides for each chapter, along with the uh, test question keys. But we also knew it was important to make it as easily as possible for instructors to integrate these test questions into their classrooms. So in order to do that, we knew we needed to deliver it in a format that would make it easier for them to upload it directly into their learning management systems. The one way we can do that is by putting them into Excel spreadsheets. We downloaded a template from our learning management system, which is D2L, and I believe they're pretty similar across the different learning management systems. We then take the template and apply it to the test questions. It doesn't matter if it's a short answer or a multiple choice or an essay question, anything like that, we can include all of that into these Excel spreadsheets so they can easily upload, be uploaded to the learning management system and come across on the learning management system as a polished test or quiz that can then be easily graded within the learning management system itself. That is just another perk of using our open textbook versus the expensive alternatives, because I know with the expensive alternatives, they offer something similar to this where you can just upload the material and it comes in a nice package for instructors. So we're trying to create an alternative for instructors so they can save students money without sacrificing as much when it comes to ancillary materials and ease of use with those ancillary materials. We protect the test questions, so we require instructors to send in a request for instructor materials, and we vet the individual to make sure they are indeed an instructor before sharing the ancillary materials that would include the test banks, because the last thing we need is for a student to get their hand on the answer key. For the open pedagogy assignments, I did the same as the other instructor guides. I tried to make the style consistent throughout the assignments for different chapters. I then assigned the headers and word for easy navigation within the documents. Part of the importance of open pedagogy is the ability to share assignments outside of the classroom and build up a bank of knowledge that applies to this textbook, for example. So we needed to figure this part out. How can we offer this and how do we offer this easy way of sharing this content that students and teachers have created? One way that we can do that is through Manifold and OpenALG in the resources section for that textbook. We will be going through the resources section and figuring out what can be uploaded and what are the limitations of that resource section so we can provide instructions to instructors on these open pedagogy assignments of how they can share this knowledge or this content and this knowledge openly. The benefit of this uh, being through OpenALG is that um, that's where the book is housed. So not only will the future users of this book be able to access the book itself, they will also be able to see the different resources that have been developed by different students and instructors throughout the life of the book and be able to contribute their own content as well, which is essentially sharing the knowledge. And that is what open is all about, right? We want to provide a way to do this because we do not believe in a paywall um, and we do not want to limit the shareability of knowledge through that paywall. So that is why open ALG with Manifold was the best option for us. The next thing I'm going to talk about is equity and access. First, we have to acknowledge with anything that is open that not everyone is going to have the same resources and not everyone is going to have access to technology. That could mean they don't have a smartphone or they don't have a laptop at home. That could also mean they don't have the internet at home. They are victims to the hours of the library essentially, where they have to engage with this content in a public setting and at limited hours. So that is something to keep in mind in creating the instructor guides and materials. They can be used in a matter of ways. They can be uploaded so the instructor can upload it to their social media platforms. They can be uploaded to their management learning management systems. They can be uploaded to blogs or websites if they have a class website or something like that. It is easily shareable to an extent. Of course, we don't want to um, 
students to have the answer key to the test questions, but the rest of the content is openly shareable across all platforms. It is also editable, like I said, so you can also edit it for sharing. In addition to it being editable and shareable, it's also printable. I mean, it is done through Word and PowerPoint, so the instructors can print off these assignments and hand them out to their students if that's what is needed. We also have to acknowledge that not everyone is a cisgender white male. Everyone um, will have a different approach and a different viewpoint, and that is the beauty of open pedagogy. You as the individual are bringing your own world experience to what you're contributing. By allowing these viewpoints to shine through with the assignments and making those assignments shareable and open, it will extend the reach of voices that are not heard as loudly or as often. For open pedagogy, we definitely would encourage instructors to encourage their students to share their viewpoints openly, whether it is through social media or through an open plat pedagogy platform like OpenALG, in order to spread their reach. We also encourage instructors to provide at-risk students alternatives. So at-risk might mean you're attending a college virtually, but you live in a country where being gay is illegal. Um, you might not want to post information about yourself being gay and that being your viewpoint on a certain topic publicly. So in that case, you may opt out to do it anonymous, anonymously, or you may, as an instructor, provide them with the option to just present within the closeness of the classroom or to just um, the instructor themselves in a private setting. So being aware of these limitations when it comes to identity and that public knowledge of identity is important for students that could possibly be at risk. I think it's also important to help students own their own identities. So even those students who are at risk might acknowledge that it's worth them sharing their identities within their work because they can show others that might identify with them how, um, can see what is possible and that there are others out there with the same viewpoint and they can share in the same experience through openly available knowledge. These different voices are important to share for this reason. Most people that I meet online via email communication or the like assume I am a man because of my name. Because of that, they have already formed opinions of what I might be like and what my viewpoints might be, which I can assure you are very different because I identify as a white woman. That assumption that I am a man can benefit me in some ways in terms of respect and being taken seriously. This also happens for people of color when they have a white sounding name. They are taken more seriously and respected more because of their name alone, because it sounds white. This is an unfortunate bias that we must break ourselves free from. Uh, by sharing my identity, I can share with others who might relate to me more as a white woman, or they might not relate to me at all and want to learn, okay, well, where do we see things differently? And I think that is an important part of the conversation and debate in the university setting. So with these open pedagogy assignments, one thing that an instructor could do is encourage students to share an image of themselves so that their audience members can see who's talking to them and maybe think about what the differences and similarities are between themselves as an audience member and the author. The concern still stands that individuals, once they share their image, may be less likely to be taken seriously, but that, that is something we must break through and change in not only the university setting, but in society as a whole. Open pedagogy is a great place to start. Thank you very much. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Ariana Adams. I am an editor with the University of North Georgia Press. And for this portion of the panel, we're gonna be speaking about formatting OER text. So basically taking all of the concepts that we have already discussed and kind of seeing how they work over in the virtual world. So when we're putting together and um, a manifold conversion, the two main programs that we end up using are the um, Adobe Acrobat application and then also the Microsoft Word application as well. Typically, we're going to start in our Adobe Acrobat program um, because for us, our textbooks typically when we are starting out with a 
version that's going to be printed in physical form for a more traditional textbook, um, we have a PDF document. So then going over and transferring it to um, something that's going to be a little bit easier for us to use with Manifold, we have to take it and reformat it over in Word. So these are our two main programs that we end up using most of the time. So for a little bit of an example for what a Manifold conversion is, I personally really like to think of it kind of as an art reproduction, wherein we're taking um, this wonderful work that people derive a lot of meaning and value from. And all we're doing with it when we translate from our Adobe document, which is, we can typically think of that as our working print version of our document, and then translating it over to our Word document version is just reproducing a work of art, basically, and making it more open and accessible for members of our community who may not have the same resource capabilities, um, sort of a little bit like what Corey talked about a few moments ago, um, so that everyone can enjoy it and derive um, meaning the way that we hope that they can. So when we first go into Word, what we're going to do is have our entire document, our entire textbook, we've copied it from our Adobe document and we've pasted it over here into our Word document template. Um, so when we are setting up to actually format our conversion in Word, we're going to need a few tools up and running. So right here, we're looking at our Britlet 2 Romantic Era to the 20th century and beyond, um, sort of simulating this conversion here. So as we set up, the first thing that we're going to need is our navigational toolbar, which we can see over here in this right column. Um, so in order to get that up and running, we go up to view and then to sidebar and navigation. And then this wonderful navigational sidebar will appear over here on our left. And then we also want our non-printing marks to be visible as well. And we can see some of these are circled over here. These are really important because when you're going through a conversion, there are going to be certain elements where if you can't see the non-printing marks, your formatting is gonna come out really wonky because you can't see exactly what's going on there. So it's very important to have these up for sake of consistency. So in order to get those viewable, we go into um, Word at the top of our screen and then to preferences, and then we select view and then all under the show non-printing characters, and these will appear. So as we can see from our some of our circled examples here, we have our P for the paragraph, the um, little arrow down by 1.1 showing certain types of indentations, and then our dots, of course, representing spaces as well. So now that we have our navigational toolbar up, it's important to note that in the previous slide, we had an unformatted version of that navigational toolbar. So everything over here in this left column that we currently see was all aligned left. When we have all of our headers organized, we're gonna get this stacked or cascading look that we see over here now. Um, this is really important because as students, faculty, staff, move through our texts online, um, these organized headers are going to be extremely important to make in ensuring that they can reach the portions of the text that they're looking for quickly and efficiently so that we're still in a certain way kind of simulating as closely as possible that um, more kind of original textbook feel but streamlining it a bit as well. So making sure that it's pretty easy to cross over from working with a traditional printed text to a online text so that we have a format that is very familiar for people to work with. So we're gonna go into now talking about how we format these headers. And our managing editor, Corey Parson, did a fantastic job um, coming up with a Word document template that includes all of these styles that we see pulled up over here on the right um, these different styles are what we use to 
organize and format our headers and also our text as well. And as you can see, the text is a little bit small, but as you can see, we do have um, each different version of a header format very well identified. Um, this is really important to not get too fancy or creative with the names, just have it be very self-explanatory so that when we are going through and formatting, we can find what we're looking for very quickly and efficiently so that we can make sure that we get our books out as quickly as possible for students. So we can see we have um, block quote, body, body note indent, caption headers, caption text, basically everything that you could possibly need. We have down at the bottom bullet, list bullet and list number. Um, there are a lot of different formats that we find in our textbooks. We have a lot of different pictures, charts, we have poems, we have prose. Um, so making sure that we have every different type of format that we could possibly need is very, very important. And Corey did a fantastic job um, coming up with this for us. So when we're looking at our headers in general, so we can see with Anna Barbald here, we have um, her formatted as heading one because she is our main overarching concept that we're dealing with for our um, sort of subsections under her subject, we would be using heading two. And if there were subsections within that section, we'd use heading three and so on. So we get that stacked look that we saw earlier over in our navigational toolbar, which again is very important for the sake of consistency. So one of the other things that we're gonna be looking at for formatting the conversion that's very important is our images. So one of the things that we try to do that is, has been very important for us is make sure that we're formatting between paragraphs so that we don't get a lot of floating. If you put a, an image in the middle of a paragraph, even if you format it correctly, we can get some sort of strange floating when we go into Manifold and OpenALG. So we make sure that we go between paragraphs and that we use our body no indent and we center and then use our caption headers accordingly as well. So that's one of the other very common um, formatting elements that we're looking at that we have to make sure that we are very consistent with as well to make sure that anyone who is reading our book um, over an ALG doesn't have any issues viewing the text because there's something strange going on with our image formatting. So one of our next elements that's pretty common that we're gonna come across a lot in a conversion is these section breaks and then our headers and footers. Um, so typically what we're gonna do with those here in our Word document is very simple, we're just gonna delete them. So for the headers and footers, you can just go in, highlight and press delete. Typically you're gonna have in those non-printing marks, there's gonna be um, some a comma that shows up that you're also going to delete. And that's just gonna make sure that we get rid of those headers and footers across all of our pages. Um, we see the section break is kind of a holdover from that Adobe document where um, we had our page breaks over there since we are, our formatting is gonna be a little bit different over in Word, we can just go ahead and highlight and delete those section break holdovers so that we can form our new ones for our new document. So one of the last things that we're gonna be looking at as far as actually working through a conversion are these little end dashes, these hyphenations that we see um, that are highlighted in the body of our work. Some of them are more towards the middle of the body of the text. Some of them may be a little bit closer to the margins, but these are also holdovers from that original Adobe PDF document that we wanna go ahead and get rid of kind of as our last final tweak before we go ahead and submit this particular document over to OpenALG. And the easiest way to do that, we go over to our toolbar again over on the left, we were in our navigational setting, so then we're gonna go over to the little um, eyeglass over here, and we're going to type in an end dash and then a space typically. Those are gonna be um, the two symbols that are gonna be coming over from Adobe PDF together. So we're gonna type those in and then hit find. And then we're going to have 
all of those appear over here in our document highlighted, and then we'll just go through and delete those as our final little detail um, before we go ahead and submit this document over to OpenALG. So once that's done, we can see our final product over here on the OpenALG website. And as we can see, there are a lot of very wonderful ways that OpenALG allows students to view our texts. So we have students who can go into EPUB and look at that version. They can look at the original PDF if they like. Um, they can look at the Word version, or they can go in and read parts one, two, and three on the OpenALG platform itself. So I'm gonna take us through so we can see a little bit of what that looks like. So here we are over in OpenALG's version of the textbook. This is where our Word document formatting really kicks in. Um, as we can see over here on the left with our headers for our table of contents, this is where all of that um, very important organization and formatting comes in so that students and faculty can go ahead and go exactly where they need to very quickly within our text. Um, without having to work too terribly hard or scroll through a bunch of pages um, in order to get where they need to go. We also have over on the right, sort of in the right corner, these wonderful additional tools that I'm gonna be taking us through as well that students can use over here on OpenALG. So the first one, we have this little eye icon. Um, this allows us to go in and highlight our text. And as you can see, I've highlighted a sentence here as an example. Um, one of the really wonderful things about OpenALG is that it's so community centric. Um, and as we can see, there is a share option after highlighting this sentence. There's an annotation option and then of course highlight. And students can go through as they're reading a book and even be able to see other students' annotations, um, which we can see is an option up in that top right corner as we're looking at that tool. Um, so that's one of the really great um, pluses with using OpenALG is that it gives students a wonderful opportunity to share ideas sort of in real time, even as they're reading their textbooks. So the next um, option that I wanted to show was annotations. And I made a small annotation um, as an example. You can kind of see it over here on the left, this light blue highlighted sentence over here. Um, and again, students have the option to share their notes. If they're working on projects, they can be in um, project groups while going through a textbook together, share notes and ideas with each other, and um, really interact with the text, which is a wonderful thing considering that students have all different types of learning preferences. Some students are much more hands-on and being able to really directly inter interact with the text in this way can be a really great opportunity for them to really ensure that they're understanding everything that they are going through. So the implications of um, using OpenALG and open educational resources in general um, are pretty wide reaching. As we have seen, um, there are some really great opportunities even for us, the people who are going through and creating um, some of these different formatting strategies and ideas. Um, this conference is a great example. Um, but we also want to encourage that to that we continue this discussion even after this conference. One of the things that um, we at the press are working towards is taking our um, Word document template and making it available on our site um, so that anyone else who would like to use it to begin doing their own conversions of their textbooks, they can absolutely do that um, easily. So um, that is about all the time we have right now. I will go ahead and pull up. We have our UNG Press site if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what we're doing over there. And then also the open ALG site, alg.manifoldapp.org. 
um, if you'd like to go over there and do a little bit of exploring on your own. But I wanna make sure that we have enough time for questions as well. So thank you all very much for listening. Um, I haven't seen any questions come. Well, I did see a few questions come through chat um, and I've answered those in chat, but I don't know, Lee, if we can maybe unmute, um, people can unmute themselves if they wanna ask a question so we could get through questions faster or. Absolutely. Yes. If, if okay. people would like to unmute, please feel free to do so and, and ask your question to our presenters. If there's no immediate questions and you have additional uh, material to add, please feel free to go ahead and do so. Um, and then if people have questions, we can find them in the chat and then you can answer them live as well. And we're um, also available if you have any questions. Um, that you uh, come across later after our discussion, um, feel free to email us. Um, we're always open to talk about openness. So. <laughs> Ariana, did you have a slide that you were dying to share at the end that <laughs> you sort of cut off because of time? Uh, nope, that's everything <laughs> that I have. Um, the only other thing that I would like to add, though, is um, that, you know, with what we've gone through, at least for the formatting, um, for me personally, when I'm going through and formatting, I'm using a, um, an Apple device when I'm going through, but other people may not be. They may be using um, Dells or other forms of computers or technology when they're going through and doing their conversions. So it really is important for us to continue um, conversations and sharing ideas and tips and tricks about um, how to do these conversions as effectively as possible with each other. Um, and that we're not just limiting it to any one form of technology there either. Um. Oh, that's awesome, Ariana. Um, yeah. And um, we've got a, a question in the chat. Um, what unique steps do you take to ensure you don't share the answers to the students who may be having access to the resources? So um, for the resources, currently we require the instructors to fill out a form on our website. Um, those instructors are at, asked to provide their names, um, where they're teaching, and then also their faculty email address. And then we go in there and to that university or that college website and look up the instructor to make sure they are indeed an instructor um, and then um, send them the materials after we vet them. So it's a, it's a pretty quick process. Um, you know, there, it's a quick turnaround, but we do make sure we don't share it with students. Um, now for the resources that we're going to be sharing, um, the open pedagogy assignments and stuff like that, um, those are the, the open assignments. So those aren't going to have answer keys or anything involved. Um, with those and then um, we'll try to make sure that the powerpoints are also shared and um, the lecture notes are shared so it's just a matter of taking them apart from the text um, the tests um, the test banks um, and um, making them available that way so um, we try to keep a lock and key on the um, on the tests and um, I think Jeff had mentioned something about um, ungrading and stuff like that and um, how it hasn't quite picked up here at the USG. So that's something that we can work on towards the future. But um, right now we have to make sure those are protected. But that that's a great question. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, and um, Kristen, I agree this. Um, uh, you know, having that integration is so critical to success and, and 
evolving with new technologies as they become available. And that's why we have to be so grateful for our partner, Open ALG, um, mm -hmm. because they're, they're really the ones who are the experts when it comes to um, the new technologies becoming available in the open community. And they kind of help bring us along with them so that we can adapt these um, materials that we've made to make it available to as many people and in, in as many ways as possible. So um, thank you for your comment, Kristen. Yeah. So we only have a couple more minutes, um, but I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation um, and <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank our presenters. Thank you for this discussion. Um, uh, please feel free to, you know, reach out. They have their information there on, on the screen. Um, follow up with them on anything that you found interesting here. And um, again, thank you for the presentation. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, we do again have a couple of minutes. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.